The number of job openings in the U.S. came in much higher than expected in the month of July. Data from the Labor Department pointing to nearly 11 million unfilled jobs in that month as the supply of workers continued to struggle to keep up with demand. Let's bring in Gus Fauché. He's PNC Financial Services Group Chief Economist. Gus, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, this is kind of the ongoing conundrum. We've been talking about so much with companies who have these job openings. They're unable to fill the jobs. What do you think the data says today about how, like, how long uh, this challenge is likely to last? Or do you anticipate to start picking back up with uh, those federal enhanced unemployment benefits expiring? Well, well, first of all, this data is from July. So in August, we saw weaker job growth. It could be that businesses pulled back some, somewhat on their hiring with the Delta variant. But even so, I think there are a huge number of open jobs out there. And right now, there aren't the workers to fill them. So I think you've got an issue with concern about unemployment insurance benefits, uh, I think you've got people who are concerned about the coronavirus, working parents whose children are home, that type of thing. I'm hopeful that we'll see more people entering the labor force over the next three, six months. Uh, we'll see what happens when the, with the expiration of these unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, but this is a huge problem for firms right now. They simply don't have enough people to fill all those job openings that they have. Yeah, and I mean, I guess it's kind of reiterating, uh, you know, the same points that we've seen uh, from that big jobs report last week that just kind of showed, you know, a lot of these sectors that had been enjoying uh, recovery really stalled out because of Delta. And when you think about how the economy seems to be weakening here and what the Fed's role in all this and how the Fed has said maybe we're not the lever to be pulled here in terms of monetary policy to help support the economy. Uh, I mean, how do you see that all playing out as we see timelines kind of adjusted when it comes to tapering and what that means for the actual economy? Um, we did see softer job growth in August, but still over the past three months, we've averaged 750,000 jobs per month, which is very strong. And I do think that even with the spread of the Delta variant, that we'll see a pickup in job growth in September when we get those numbers in, in early October. Uh, I think Presuming we get a solid job number of, let's say, 600,000 for September, uh, that, I think, would allow the Fed to say, we're going to start reducing our balance sheet. Monetary policy is still highly expansionary at this point. I think it's just going to get a little bit less expansionary. I think we'll see the Fed announce in November that they're going to start to reduce their balance sheet in December and then gradually pull off back on those purchases of longer-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Gus, what do you anticipate will lead to the pickup that you've pointed to? I mean, these obviously the the unemployment benefits have been one factor, and yet uh, so many conversations we've had on the show from businesses, uh, from those who've been following the labor market, say it's really not just about the wage story anymore. It's about flexibility. It's about added benefits. And when you think about the sectors that have been hurt the most, uh, they're not necessarily seeing the employees come back because they're looking at other opportunities that are out there. That's right. And, and so, for example, in August, we saw uh, no change in leisure hospitality services employment. Uh, we actually saw a decline in retail trade employment. These are face-to-face -face positions where people may be reluctant to take on a new job, particularly given the Delta variant. But businesses are going to have to make accommodations. Uh, they're competing for workers right now. They're going to have to offer higher pay. Uh, they're going to off have to offer mitigation against the coronavirus. Uh, and they're going to need to offer flexibility in terms of work schedule, location, all of that type of thing. Um, businesses uh, are just having incredible difficulty in filling these positions, uh, and they're no going to need to give potential workers what they want in terms of pay, in terms of benefits, in terms of flexibility, if they want to fill those to meet the strong demand that they're, they're seeing. Yeah, and, and Gus, I mean, when we think about what kind of sparked all the jitters uh, earlier on this year, at least in the stock market, uh, it was a discussion around inflation and whether or not we were going to see that run hotter than what the Fed's uh, policy goals are here. Uh, you seem to be in the camp that the long run inflation here is unlikely to move too far above the Fed's 2% target. Um, talk to me about maybe how the, the Delta surge here and what we've seen in some of those pieces of the economy and, and purchases that had seen big spikes in prices, I'm thinking airline travel, uh, rental cars as well, how it all shakes out and maybe why that's true that we aren't expecting to see it run too hot for too long. 
Yeah, so obviously we saw huge increases in prices in a few segments of the economy where we saw demand come back very strongly, but also saw problems with supply. So airfares, new cars, used cars, rental cars, hotels, those types of things. A uh, couple things going on, first of which is concern about the, the Delta variant is leading to reduced demands for some of these industries. So reduced demand for rental cars, perhaps for airfare, that type of thing. And then also it's going to take some time, but these supply chain problems will eventually be worked out. We will see the automakers, uh, they'll get those computer chips in, they'll start to build cars again. That will help reduce some of those price pressures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I think that we will see um, prices for a lot of those goods and services decline. That's going to reduce some of those inflationary pressures. And so I think by the time we get to early 2022, a lot of the heat on inflation is going to be removed, and that's going to give the Fed more flexibility. 